Yeah, okay, it's working. So I'm going to invite our esteemed speaker, um, who needs no introduction, so I shall not introduce. Um, no. <laughs> um, please introduce yourself for the audience real fast. Hi, everybody. I'm Eyal. I'm a mathematician. I did a PhD in mathematics from Berlin. I do consulting, I do freelancing, and I do open source projects. I'm doing uh, BISC since a few years now, but today I'm going to speak about Almonit and the centralized website, which is quite new. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, I need the microphone back just so I can say I'm leaving the stage because if I was to leave the stage while he was talking, it would be kind of weird and awkward and stuff. So I am now leaving the stage. Uh, let's give a great big hand. Um, not for me, guys, for him. Thank you, Diego, who already thanked himself, but nevertheless. <laughs> um, actually, I was about to begin with introducing myself, but this happened, so let's begin with a project, right? Are you past it here? Oh yeah, right. Good. Almonit. Almonit is a new project. We began it about half a year ago. Um, I don't know if you haven't began like a new open source community project, but when you begin, you're like aiming for the stars. And that's like why our first slogan was centralizing the web. And when you see this, you think two things. One, you're like, what? Is it 2017? And second, you say, Hey, ain't the web already decentralized? And yes, the web was designed in decentralized way, and it began decentralized, but I think that it didn't scale so well and still being decentralized. Um, for example, DNS is supposed to be decentralized, but we are about to sell the dog old domain to a third party, which is a commercial company, which we don't know what they will do with it. Email is supposed to be decentralized. I mean, it is a decentralized architecture. It's like a Fediverse. Uh, but everybody uses Gmail. I have my own email domain, and my emails often go to a spam folder, or somebody, sometimes they are just rejected, which is somehow OK for me, because my, my professional head is the crazy guy who is into privacy and decentralization, and people hire me because of it. But my lawyer had a private domain, and when her email started to go to spam folder, she had to switch to something which is backed by Google because she couldn't afford losing customers over that. It doesn't seem professional. So the web was decentralized. It's still quite decentralized, but there is a decentralization element in that. The other issue with the slogan, decentralize the web, is that it's very vague. It doesn't really say what we do. And in the last six months, we actually, what we did was the websites tools. The websites is how we call decentralized websites. And what I mean by the website's tools is, I'm going to show you a movie. Yeah, this one. OK, I hope it's good enough. It's not so great, it's not so great quality. Um, this is a record of what we are going to publish in two weeks. It's a search engine. I mean, you saw search engines in your life. Nowadays, they all look the same. The nice thing about this search engine is that it's a decentralized search engine, which is a decentralized website for decentralized websites. It's a bit long. But what you should really remember is that you can use it to find which decentralized websites exist. And it doesn't run on our server. So it's run like in a decentralized P2P network, which means it's completely private or as private as the P2P network is. And it's not really censorable because try to DDoS IPFS, it's quite, or even block it, it's quite a task. So those are the advantages of this. It's going to be released in two weeks. What we have now in our website is a directory of decentralized websites. And I'm going to speak about it a bit more later on. OK. I'm a bit amateur when it comes to using Mac. Now let's address the lion in the room, because we have a strange logo, we have a lion, and we have a strange name, and unless you are a Hebrew speaker, you probably don't know what it means. So let's begin with the lion. Why do we have a lion? Well, we have a lion because Mozilla got a fox, and we like Mozilla, and lion and fox relate. So now we got a lion, a fox, and a lion, and together we got a jungle, which is cool because it's also kind of our statement. We, we want the internet to be like a jungle. There are entities who want it nowadays to be like a field, very organized, very planned. Um, 
sterile, maybe something that like is being decided by the person who who plants the field and not the people who live in the field. And we want to be like a jungle, which is slightly more chaotic, but also more rich, more fertile. And you know, in, in the jungle you have lions uh, grow, in the field you have frogs. So we, we go for the jungle thing. It also, I, I like to read, so I try like in every talk that I give to at least mention one book. Uh, this book is from the 90s, the end of the 90s. It's Seeing Like a State by James C. Scott. He speaks about and mostly against high modernism, which is how he called the states that were formed in the 20th century, which were trying to control and plan the lives of the citizens as much as possible. It's very thought intriguing. I, I don't agree with much of the stuff that he writes, but this goes for every book that I read. Uh, and what's relevant for us here is that in the first chapters, he speaks about the science of forestry, so designing a forest. Apparently, by the first chapter, it began in Germany in the end of the 18th century. And before that, forests were a bit like a jungle, but not as diverse, but still something rich and chaotic. Uh, but for the state, a forest was a place from which you take wood. And they started to design the forest such that it will have mostly wood and not other stuff, and also the kind of wood that they have, and also that you could access it. So the German forest, I, I do a lot of bicycle trips. The German forest is very organized. It's rows and this. I was never lost in a German forest. I was lost in Ukraine in a forest for half a day. In a German forest, if I get lost, I just have to choose a direction and suck, and after half an hour tops, I'm out. <laughs> um, I, I noticed that like myself with the bicycle trips, and then I saw it in the book, and, what, what, and, and, and this, so it was good for the state for the beginning because they got like really good lumber and a lot of it and they needed it for construction. It was bad for the farmers, it was bad for people who lived near the forest, who live of the forest, for the ecosphere. But what turned out that after a century, in the end of the 19th century, it was also bad for the forest because suddenly the third generation of woods that they planted didn't grow. It grew up in the first and second generation because the forest was so fertile, because it was so diverse. And then, again, I'm quoting the book. I didn't really find other good sources for that. A new word entered the German vocabulary, a Waldsterben, which was a phenomenon that happened apparently in the end of the 19th century. And I think that this story makes you understand maybe why we want a jungle and not a field and not like something so science. Of course, you also don't want the internet to be a complete chaos because we are not living in the Wild West and there is also bad people who want to do bad stuff. But you should govern it around what people do and not tell people what to do around what you want. Then there is another element here, which is the word almonit. Almonit is in Hebrew. It means anonymous. It's a feminine uh, form of the adjective. So we are in into privacy. The other cool thing is with Tel Aviv. I'm from Tel Aviv originally. Tel Aviv has an Eli called almonit Eli. Uh, it's simta almonit. Simta is Eli in Hebrew. It's a very small Eli. And if you enter the Eli, in the end of the Eli, of you see a statue of a golden lion, and it's nice when things work out. <laughs> That's about us, the project, the name, the lion, and now we can speak about the websites. So, the websites was not invented by us. Uh, we also don't build the websites, we make tools for the websites. I, I, I know the websites from ZeroNet from 2015, which was a project that did decentralized websites. I, I liked it. Uh, it's different than us. We also, I mean, it's quite different than us, but the idea is the same. Perhaps it was before. I'm not so sure, to be honest. And to explain what is it in the way that we make it or we uh, refer to, let's, perfect, let's first speak, like, you know, explain to me, like, five years old, what is a website. So this is me. This is a picture of me that a friend drew when I was 20. I already didn't have any hair, but I still didn't have a hat. And I want to surf the internet, regular website. So I got a name, I go to a name service, DNS, and I ask the name service, hey, where can I find the content of this name? And the name service gives me back the IP or the address of a server, and I go to the server and I ask for it. So the server gives me the website, and then nowadays begin kind of exchange of me and the server, like back and forth. This is the dynamics of websites, because that's the websites are not static nowadays. Uh, sometimes there are, I mean sometimes, there are always other people in the internet. I tend to think that all the people look like me, so it's written not me, but let's assume it's still me. 
And I, the other, not me, speaks with the server. The server lets us communicate, and you have more dynamics. And I stress this dynamic because this is the part which is difficult to recreate in the centralized website. The, the whole talking back and forth with the server, the server being someone that connects people, uh, that remembers states, that lets you know that you speak to one person which is connected to it and not to a million who try to scam you. This is what is difficult to recreate. So now we go to the websites, and it's still me. But now I have a different name. This name is not part of the DNS registry. It's a, some random name. And instead of going to DNS, I go to a decentralized name service, like Namecon, which was here yesterday, though we actually use ENS, Ethereum name service. It's based on Ethereum. There are two reasons why we use it. Uh, a, I, 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 I'm not a huge fan of Ethereum, but I'm a huge fan of ENS. I think that they've been doing a very good job of trial and error of how to create a decentralized name service. It's still in alpha, so it's not perfect, but they did a good job. And B, they also did a good job of like business uh, pr process. So it's supported by some browser. People know of it. And the third thing is that the D website in the current form was just began there. There were about 10 when we began, so we, we, it, it was natural to use it. I'm not going to say exactly how ENS works because that's like another topic for another lecture, but what is important for us, standard things, is that you can buy their name. The name points to, a, to some kind of value, like IP or something else. Um, the, the purchase process is automatic and it's irreversible. So now you are away from the whole DNS thing, hey, my name can be taken, which happens once in a while, or the price can go up, et cetera, et cetera. It's predictable. And it is private as much as Ethereum is private. And I know that there are Monero people here, and I love Monero, who will tell me Ethereum is completely not private. But let's say it's a different model of privacy than buying with a DNS. At least I don't have to use my credit card and do KYC and this kind of stuff and give my address. The non-standard thing that it gives me is that one name can point to many values. So you can won't point it to a Monero wallet, which actually I think some people even do, or to Ethereum wallet, or to different to IP, or some decentralized storage. Uh, it has a compl complex ownership model. So now it's not like one person owns a name. You can have a multi-sig owning a name. You can do something that changes with time. Like today, I own the name, but in one year, it will automatically switch to someone else. And it creates some kind of interest in new stuff, new stuff that you can do with it. And it also has the automation of ownership, which connects, of course, to, to number two. So I go to ENS. I get from them something. And what I get is an address in decentralized storage or, this, or a file sharing peer-to-peer -peer network of where the website is. We use IPFS for that because IPFS, again, it's a topic for a whole lecture, but it really fits this decentralized website thing. There are people who use Swarm. I think that there are also people who use DAT, which is another uh, decentralized storage or file sharing peer-to-peer -peer network. IPFS is definitely the most common one. IPFS, the standard thing where it's file sharing. So this, we all know what, we, what, it, what it is. And the less standard thing is that names are hashes of content. So you cannot now copy my website and give it a different name because it will be a different hash. Uh, it's really easy linking between different repositories of, 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 of IPFS, between different files. And this is important for website. You can link from one to the other really easy. You can link inside. It, it's so convenient in IPFS. And again, like ENS, they have good infrastructure. So they have libraries, uh, JavaScript libraries on Rust, and, and they have a whole big ecosphere of people working on it, which makes it easier for us to do stuff with it. Because I think one of the problems with ZeroNet was that the, the ecosphere was not so diverse. And here we are building of infrastructure of ENS and IPFS, which, which help us just to be more reachable. Why do you need decentralized websites? Well, I think that the first reason is uh, what I call uh, the big three lions of decentralization. What you get from almost every peer-to-peer -peer network on decentralization pro uh, uh, project, which is its censorship resistance. It is super difficult to block IPFS or every other peer-to-peer -peer network which is big enough. It's robust. The same thing goes for DDoS. It's very difficult to take offline. So if you're an activist organization, it can be a really good solution for you. And it's private as far as Ethereum and IPFS are private. 
uh, which is up to discussion and can also be improved, and we will be happy to actually also check some more private networks to do it in. The non-standard thing is that you can do collective websites. So this comes to this complex ownership of names. You can do a website which is owned by a group, and every person of the group can change it, but then like half of the group can ban someone if he did something or she did something not okay. You, you can have like a society moderating and managing themselves, which is very nice, and it's really difficult to do with the DNS model. Uh, you will have to start to manage access to the server, and still there will be operators. Here it is so easy and natural to do that, and it's one big pro of the D websites that I like. The cons of the websites, and you should always say, of course, what is bad with what you do. It is slower. Um, you know, Google has AMP, which I hate, but it's super fast. The websites are slower. Uh, how fast is it really depends, because if it's a huge website, then sometimes from P2P network you can get big files very quickly, but still the connection to the P2P network takes a time. And the privacy, as I said already twice, depends on ENS and IPFS. So it's also something to consider, because sometimes you can just monitor those networks and know what people do. So it is a consideration. Now the question comes, what do we do with, the w with those D websites? And the first thing that we do is the search engine. So right now, we began with a, just a directory, like Yahoo style directory from the 90s, where you have all the websites there, one by one. It worked well when there were 20. Now we are like in the hundreds, so it's a complete chaos. I designed it. I shouldn't be designing stuff, so it's also not so pretty. This one designed uh, another member of the project who is much better than mine, and it's a proper search engine. The great thing about it is it's private, and this is really private because it's really done uh, mostly client side. Uh, I mean, people know that you use, uh, that you use uh, if somebody really monitors the network, maybe they can use, know that you did a search, but not knowing what you searched. It's decentralized. And the other thing is, of course, it's more difficult to scale. It's great for a few hundred websites. It would work for a few thousands, probably for a few dozens, thousands, which should also be okay, especially using the special IPFS linking options so we can uh, do their decentralized databases. But uh, if it gets to millions or billions of websites, we have a lot of research to do. Th there is a field called uh, um, distributed information retrieval, and there is, uh, I think, a relatively well old and known project, even from Germany, if I'm not mistaken, of a uh, distributed search engine called YAYC, if I remember correctly. We have a lot of study from them, and we want to see how we can use IPFS or DAT or Swarm special properties to, to scale it better and to make it faster. Second thing that we do, and that's the first thing that we published, was a browser extension. Because it's great if you do a D website, you still have to access it somehow. Um, you can use our extension right now mostly to access websites. It works in Firefox, in Chromium-based browsers, and we also want in the future, like in the near future, to have it working on Tor, so you can have dark web there. There are, our end goal for this is actually to have it more like a decentralization add-on. Um, and, and the other thing is that you may think that this is temporarily, because if this thing really takes off, let's say in five years or whatever, it's a dream. Uh, then Firefox and Chrome, and Chrome and Google will just add support for resolving it themselves. You will not need any more the browser extension. But the thing is that it's very important to know how this thing is being resolved. Because if instead of going to a P2P network, you just took everything from a Google server or from some gateway, then you just added like a centralized bottleneck in between. And our extension, we always say, is the most decentralized add-on for decentralized websites. So we really make an effort to do random choices so uh, you will not always go for the same path and one gateway in IPFS will, on one node, one seed node will not get too much power and this kind of stuff. And the third thing, which is in planning, in the development, is what we call Almonit build. Name may be changed. And this lets you build decentralized websites because if you find the topic interesting right now, there are two things that you can do. One, you can talk to us and try to help with our infrastructure and, and, and the algorithms and stuff like this. But the other thing is you could build a D website because we need more of those and we need people experimenting with those. And if you're a web developer, you can experiment, but if you just want one, maybe you want an easy tool for that. With the Almonit build would be like a simple UI that you can build websites. It will be for 
personal websites, obviously the first thing that we will have because it's so easy and simple. Blogs or CMS, like content management system, uh, because everybody uses Medium and I don't use Medium. I, I, I don't like Medium and I would be happy. I, I have like my WordPress blog, but Medium is easy and I would be happy to give like as easy but decentralized alternative for that. And e-commerce, if you want to open shops, and I, I, I'm in favor of legal shops, by the way. <laughs> State of the ecosphere. So we've been doing it for half a year. When we started, there were pretty sure we counted there 13 websites, three of them were ours, so 10 besides us. And now there are like over 100. And the thing that people do websites on is first thing of all, personal websites. You know, I love developers. They do uh, sometimes boring stuff, sometimes beautiful stuff, sometimes strange stuff. This stripe is here is like a shell website where you have to actually walk to see what's there, and it's really cool. There are many of us. Uh, the other thing which is there a lot of is blockchain projects for very obvious reasons. One of them, I think Blockchain Router, has only a D website. I couldn't find the regular website, which is cool. And it's a beautiful website. So if, if you actually download the add-on afterwards, the extension, and, and look for websites, check out their website. It's really beautiful. And then there are already people who try to commercialize it or to monetize it. I give you four examples. Um, the first one, which for me was the first, the most obvious, is decentralized exchanges, because decentralized exchanges always have an issue of decentralized exchange is not supposed to have an operator. But if you have a website, then you operate the website, and it looks like and, and it is literally operating. Uh, Bisc, the one that I did, that's why we didn't have an, a website. We are a software, and the software is supposed to be updated from the P2P network. But people like software less and less. So lots of decentralized exchanges have been moving to D websites. Uh, all of them seems to be an experimental stage, though it seems that you can still use it. I didn't try myself. Other thing is e-commerce, and this is mostly selling merchandise, but you know, that's what the internet is for, merchandise. Then gambling, only one, uh, but it will come, I guess. It's, it's also one of the first things that you do in anything. And this one, who is taking sats, is actually selling subdomains of, sat of a decentralized domain. Uh, because Nick Johnson from ENS wrote kind of a repository for it for GitHub. It was cloned a few times, and then people were selling subdomains, and other people were buying that, which is nice, I mean, cool. And then, of course, I guess people here know what is Rule 34, meaning what if you do something in the internet, people will use it for porn. So people have been using it for porn, but it's censored. <laughs> and when I say porn, in this case, this is like the most softcore of the softcore that existing. It's a hentai drawing of of stuff, so it's light, it's like rule 34 quotation marks. Yes, there are already some browsers that support it. Uh, of course, the alternative one, Opera, supports it. They were, I think, the first one. Status, which is a DAP browser uh, for the smartphone, supports it, and they've been doing a very good job with it. Brave have been uh, announced that they are going to support it, but I'm not sure what is up with it. At least in my Brave browser, it's not working yet. And soon, like in a few years, other will come. <laughs> so we, we, we don't really think of Firefox or, or Google, obviously, yet. That's it. If you want to follow us, go to our Twitter, Go Almonit. We don't tweet that much. What we tweet is like updates on the projects, kind of articles that we write in our blog. And when somebody makes a new decentralized website, because we monitor that, we let people know that there's a new interesting decentralized website. You can write us for any good reason in the world. You know, we are sitting bored near the computer waiting for emails, so we are always happy for those. We also have a D website, almonit.eth, and there is a blog in blog.almonit.eth. Or if you don't feel like going to a D website because you have need right now to either have Opera or install an extension for that, you can go to our boring website, almonit.club, which is a complete clone of it. Thank you very much. This would be. All. Questions? Questions? Oh, uh, yeah. So I will be happy to answer any questions if anyone has some. So there is one, one gentleman there, but I can hardly see you. I apologize. Uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. It was quite interesting. And uh, have a good luck with Almanid. Uh, Thank you. One question. So, uh, obviously, IPFS is like the 
best uh, at the time for the storage, but isn't uh, ENS is kind of uh, not that uh, good solution uh, in uh, future proof? I mean, uh, because it's based uh, on Ethereum anyway, and uh, it's decentralized, but it, it is locked to Ethereum of sorts. Like, uh, is it is it really a good solution, or are there any alternatives at all? S like, uh, it, it's a good question. I, uh I would say that the ENS people themselves don't think that what they have now is, is the final version and right, right now what they have is probably not a great solution. First thing of all, because what they have now is, uh, I mean, you can ch they, they can change everything using uh, multi, um, sorry, like signatures of seven people. So it's not the final version. Um, they also have another issue which scares me a bit, which is squatting. Which I, which is, I mean, it was problem with DNS. It, 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 it will be a bigger problem with ENS, and it is tethered to Ethereum, which uh, Ethereum have Ethereum itself has uh, having changed as going to Ethereum 2.0, and and you don't know what will happen in this sphere. We are that said, I like ENS because it is the best naming system with ISO. Namecoin is great. I don't know it that much to really compare completely, but ENS has been doing great jobs, and Nick Johnson, who I think founded it, as far as I know, has been doing a good job, so it's a good reason to use it. We can, so we can switch uh, from one ENS version to another, from not one domain decentralized name service to another. We can even support a few. So we are not tethered to this. To this. The decentralized search engine, um, can really easily switch to another same system. So I think it's a best solution that we have for now. And I don't, you know, you have to see how things develop. Other questions? Okay, so since this doesn't seem to be the case, I'm gonna give you back the lovely Diego. Thank you, Neiman. Let's give him a hand. Namecoin is pretty good. You should you should consider it. The Namecoin guy is floating around here somewhere. Um, <coughs> and I disagree. I disagree about squats. He says squats would be a problem. Everybody should be doing squats. It's a different kind of squat, but you should be squatting if you want to extend your life. Lift weights. <laughs>